Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Edward Gonzalez Tennant. So I'm a lecturer here at the University of Central Florida in the Department of Anthropology. And so this talk tonight is of course uh, sponsored by the Central Florida chapter of the Archaeological Institute of America. And I'm going to uh, post a link for sort of our local officers and, and such in a moment. But of course, if you're not a member of AIA, that's not a problem. But if you'd like to help us support these great lectures, you can join that by going to archaeological.org. And when you sign up for a membership, you can select the Central Florida chapter. And that actually helps us build our membership, but also bring more of these talks to Central Florida and Orlando. Um, I also want to thank our, our publicist officer, which you see here, right, Allison Hudson. Um, for facilitating this, but also at the end, we'll have a Q&A and she'll be facilitating that. You can type into the chat after uh, the, the presentation or use the little raise your hand icon and, and we can have a little bit of back and forth following Dr. Serwin's talk. Um, and then of course, uh, like I said a moment ago, I'll, I'll post this into the chat. Takes me a moment here. Uh, this is our link for information about our local chapter. So if you'd like to learn more, please visit that. Um, and now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nancy Serwin, our speaker for the evening, right? And, and she is with the School of Art at Arizona State University. She holds PhD and MA degrees from Princeton, as well as an MA from the University of Chicago and a BA from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research interests include the choroplastic arts of Cyprus and ancient Israel, particularly their production and manufacturing, as well as cross-cultural stylistic influences and the role played by terracotta votive sculpture in cult ritual and religious ritual, or sorry, religious worship. So talk tonight is, um, the, the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. Obviously, I think a lot of us are excited to hear about this. Um, and so if you missed it, right, this is basically um, a, a talk offering details of what is known of the famed library. In addition to housing right, an incredible literary corpus, the library attracted some of the best minds of the ancient world. Um, so serving as a repository for an exceptional quantity of written material, the loss of information in ancient Alexandria by the destruction of this library in this talk will be cast in the light of the lamentable historical reality in the modern era of the destruction of libraries as a political tool to erase cultural memory. So with that, I want to I want to thank you again, Dr. Serwin for, or sorry, Serwin for being with us. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Well, thank you. I should I should offer two things before we begin. Number one, I have a little cat, and if she strolls through, I apologize for Bella. Number two, as I have three computer screens up and running, I am quite sure I can handle changing the correct um, screen. But if something goes wrong, Ed, will you just let me know? Nancy, you're pressing the wrong button. Thank you. Anyway, good evening. It's a pleasure for me to be able to speak to you, the members of the Central Florida chapter of the AIA. I wish the restrictions of the pandemic were otherwise so we could be together in person and that way I could warmly thank Allison Hudson for her many gracious emails and for orchestrating the logistics for tonight's lecture. So thank you, Allison, very much. I would also like to thank the Archaeological Institute of America for designating this talk as the Peter von Blankenhagen Lecture for the 2021 AIA Lecture Series. Professor von Blankenhagen was born in 1909 in Riga, Latvia, then under the Russian Tsar. After the Bolshevik excuse me, Revolution, his family fled to Germany, where he was educated in classical archaeology. It was in 1947 when Professor Blankenhagen came to the United States as a visiting professor at the University of Chicago, and he later taught at Harvard. He had a long and distinguished career specializing in Roman painting and sculpture, and he is especially remembered for his publication, The Paintings from Bosco Tricasse. In 1982, he was awarded the AIA's Gold Medal for Distinguished Archaeological Achievement. At his death in 1990, Professor von Blankenhagen was the Robert Lehman Professor Emeritus of Fine Arts at the Institute of Fine Arts of New York University. So it's a great honor that this lecture is presented in the memory of such an eminent scholar. 
So tonight's lecture, I should begin by providing a very big disclaimer. The title, The Burning of Books, The Destruction of the Library of Alexandria is a little bit misleading. Actually, we're going to be considering more than just the Library of Alexandria and the holdings of the library were not books at all, at least not in the form that we know them. Given what we're going to talk about, maybe this is more accurate. Words on fire, the destruction of the knowledge of the world. For all of us who are literate people, who love language, cherish ideas and revel in the capacity of the human mind, our session this evening holds the possibility of breaking your heart. You might ask the question, what drew me to this topic in the first place? I teach ancient art at Arizona State and my focus is on the cultural achievements of the Greeks, Romans and Egyptians. Those achievements included some of the most exquisite works of art humans had ever produced. But then this happened. It seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? And I know some of you in the audience, you might not even have been born. Um, on the 2nd of August, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And the subsequent response from a 12 nation US led coalition that began in January of 1991 and ended one month later, ultimately put antiquities in jeopardy. This was the case not only because of the ground war and aerial campaigns, but because of other decisions that were made and subsequent consequences that could easily be regarded as collateral damage. After the Gulf War of 1991, the United States, along with Great Britain and France, enforced two no-fly zones in Iraq. The one in the north was to protect the Kurdish population in the area while the Southern no-fly zone was established to protect Shiite Muslims. Iraqi aircraft were forbidden to fly within those two areas and this had major consequences for archeological sites. With no-fly restrictions, the countryside could not be patrolled and archeological sites were left unattended. Because of UN excuse me, sanctions, foreign archeologists were forbidden to return and resume excavations. For the first time in 50 years, illegal digging was reported. Dozens of sites were looted because of the lack of monitoring. You all know that Iraq is an archeological rich country. It's been estimated that the total number of archeological sites, this means known and yet to be discovered, may be anywhere from 20,000 to 100,000. So the looting that went on, particularly in Southern Iraq was devastating. A tragic example of the looting is this site, Um al Akarib in southern Iraq, a five square kilometer site that date, excuse me, dated to the early dynastic period in Mesopotamia. That's about 2900 to 2350 BC. It included two temples and a palace. The pockmarks that you see are the result of looters digging for antiquities. In many instances, the looters pits continued underground in a network of tunnels, all for the purpose of finding objects that could be sold on the market. The Iraqi economy was shattered after Desert Storm and it was soon realized that objects from the country's rich cultural heritage were lucrative. The impact of looting was realized all the more when photographic surveys began to document the extent of destroyed sites and here are two more out of the hundreds. The extent of the looting became manifest when hundreds of thousands of objects like these began appearing for sale on the market. Some were still covered with dirt indicating that they were freshly looted. What you were looking at of course are cuneiform tablets which are written texts from ancient Mesopotamia. After the first Gulf War, they became available for sale with prices ranging from a few hundred dollars to many thousands. In more recent memory, we all witnessed the systematic destruction of antiquities in Syria and Iraq by ISIS. The decided policy of eradicating earlier cultures began in 2014 and the obliteration of monuments and artifacts was particularly aggressive in the ISIS held city of Mosul and it is the inside of the museum that you see in the upper left. 
In addition to erasing cultural memory, many objects that were not destroyed were sold on the market. Experts have not agreed on the exact amount that the Islamic State had made from the antiquities trade, and estimates have ranged anywhere from millions to seven billion. The amount reflects incredible financial gain, and it is sobering to remember that the November 2015 Paris attacks that killed 130 people likely cost no more than $10,000 to stage. As much as I have been deeply dis disturbed as an archeologist at the destruction of antiquities, I have to admit that I was much more affected by reports of the systematic burning and looting of libraries in Iraq. It was the burning of the Iraq National Library and Archive in 20, uh, 2003 that included the included the central Akfa market, excuse me, library that you see here that became the visceral turning point for me. Some artifacts are priceless to be sure, but in some cases, multiple or similar objects exist. That isn't always the case with books and manuscripts. Many items are unique and when they are destroyed, they cannot be replaced. Reports were never conclusive as to what was lost due to the deliberate burning of the library and archives in Baghdad. Some reports maintained that 6,000 manuscripts in Arabic, Persian, and Turkish were lost, many of which were rare. A report submitted to UNESCO indicates 40% of the manuscripts and 90% of the printed books were destroyed. At the time of the fire, a British journalist reported flames 30 meters high bursting from the windows. So that's how my exploration began. I was profoundly affected by the willful destruction of objects, books, and print that could never be restored. This image is a powerful one. Richly bound in leather, books being devoured in a storm of flames. As I began to look further into the destruction of books, I soon learned that throughout the history of this atrocity, books and documents have been lost to us in different ways. Certainly fire destroys books, and this can be the result of various circumstances. There are accidents, some the result of human carelessness. There are natural disasters, book repositories at the center of earthquakes, tornadoes, and accidental fires. And destruction is not always by fire. Water damage is catastrophic for books. In the aftermath of the devastating March um, 11, 2011 earthquake in Japan, it was reported that 1.8 million books in the National Library in Tokyo had fallen off shelves on the second floor of the library. Tokyo was inland, so the damage was not severe. This was not the case for coastal libraries, many of which were swept away in the tsunami. Those libraries that were not totally lost were inundated by seawater, and it has taken years for restoration programs to be effective. Closer to home, there were numerous reports of horrific water damage to libraries that took place during Hurricane Katrina and the breaching of levees. At Congregation Beth Israel in New Orleans, the seven Torah scrolls and more than 3,000 sacred books remained submerged in water for two weeks. After being rescued, the scrolls and books could not be salvaged, so they were buried in the congregation cemetery. Destruction is destruction and loss is grievous, but the damage seems all the more catastrophic when the intention is deliberate, and those losses have been staggering. Willful destruction is the case with this image. It is associated with the burning of the Jaffna Public Library during the Sri Lankan Civil War. During the nights of May 31st to June 1st in 1981, a mob of Sinhalese origin went on a rampage and destroyed the library. The fire was regarded as one of the most violent examples of book destruction of the 20th century. The library was one of the largest in Asia and contained over 97,000 books and manuscripts. Nothing survived the fire but the hulk of the structure on the right. A commentator writing on one of the memorial anniversaries of the fire said the following, quote, someone quite rightly pointed out that it was a crime against humanity, 
No doubt it is a crime which struck at the very heart of the Tamil culture and civilization, a crime which is tantamount to rape, a rape not of the body, but of the hearts and minds. For this repository of knowledge, culture and history represented the pride and dignity of the Tamil people. The willful destruction of books has been called by a recent author, Libricide, which literally means from the Latin into the murder of books. The phenomenon has sadly taken place throughout history, and I will show you just a few examples. Remember, the intention of the perpetrators was always to destroy culture and historical memory. And of course, when that happens, the entire world ultimately suffers. The Imperial Library in Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, was the last of the great libraries of the ancient world. During the course of its history, it had suffered from unintentional fires. It was in 473 AD that a fire broke out and it is, it is reported that 120,000 volumes were lost. It was in 1204 that the library was targeted by the Knights Templar of the Fourth Crusade when fires ravaged the city. The books in the library were burned and those that survived were sold. Many of the recovered books later were absorbed into the Sultan's library after Constantinople was captured by the Ottoman Turks in 1453. Just over a hundred years later in 1562, during the Spanish conquest of the Yucatan, Franciscan monk and conquistador, Bishop Diego de Landa, deliberately set fire to Prussian Mayan texts. This is what he said of the event. We found a large number of books in these characters and as they contain nothing in which were not to be seen as superstition and lies of the devil, we burned them all, which they, the Maya, regretted to an amazing degree and which caused them much affliction. That same affliction was sorely felt when the Library of Congress was destroyed during the two and a half year conflict of the War of 1812. The Library of Congress had been signed as an act of Congress in 1800 during the presidency of John Adams. And two years later in 1802, President Thomas Jefferson had been responsible for its physical structure. Located on Capitol Hill, the library was set on fire by British troops with its contents of 3000 volumes destroyed. Within a month, former President Jefferson offered his personal library as a replacement which he had spent 50 years accumulating. The library today holds more than 39 million catalog books and 73 million manuscripts, making it the second largest library by collection size, eclipsed only by the British Library. The US Library of Congress had been storing 50, excuse me, 500 million tweets per day as part of its efforts to build a Twitter archive. Twitter signed on um, an agreement in April 2010 to provide the library with an archive of every public tweet since the company went live in 2006. By 2013, the year of the latest archive information I could find, 170 billion tweets had been added to its collection. And this was of course before um, former President Trump started adding tweets as well. Um, in 2017, it was announced that the library would no longer archive every public tweet, adding that it would be more selective in the future. And good thing that storage is digital. Of the several buildings that make up the Library of Congress, the Jefferson Building above and the Madison Building below measure 2,100,000 square feet. The Madison Building is one of the three largest buildings in Washington, along with the Pentagon and the FBI building. Back in Europe and in the early 20th century in 1914, the library of the Catholic University of Leuven was destroyed by the advancing German army. The university was distinguished as the largest, oldest and most prominent university in Belgium. About 300,000 books were lost in the fire. Donations received from around the world allowed the library to be rebuilt 
and the structure was designed by American architect Whitney Warren. Sadly, the library suffered again in 1940 during the second German invasion of Leuven. During an exchange of fire between the German and allied armies, the library was burnt down and this time 900,000 manuscripts and books were destroyed. What you see on the screen is the present library built according to Warren's original plans. Among the many atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis, a book burning campaign conducted by the German student, student Union took place in the 1930s in Nazi Germany and Austria. It was on the 10th of May, 1933, that students burned over 25,000 volumes of what were considered un-German books that were regarded as subversive or representing ideologies opposed to Nazism. In many university towns on this night, students marched in torch-lit parades and high Nazi officials, professors, and student leaders addressed spectators who had gathered to watch while books were thrown on bonfires. In Berlin, 40,000 people had gathered in the square at the State Opera, listening to Joseph Goebbels say, no to decadence and moral corruption, yes to decency and morality in family and state. The ethnic basis for the destruction of books has continued in more recent times. On the night of August 25th in 1992, Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina was under siege by Bosnian Serbs. The National Library had no military significance but was targeted and firemen who arrived to put out the flames were shot at. The Sarajevo National Library was completely destroyed in the fire and 80% of its contents were lost. Three million books were consumed in the flames along with hundreds of original documents from the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. The materials testified to the history of Bosnia and its proud identity as a multi multicultural society. The destruction of the library was a deliberate objective to crush the cultural identity of an entire country. During the siege of Sarajevo, Celos Vidran Smelovic often played in destroyed buildings in the city and at funerals even though targeted by snipers. He would play Abenoni's Adagio in G minor. And here he is within the ruins of the library. Within the last decade, the litany of destruction of libraries has continued with libraries as collateral damage during regime change. During the Arab Spring in Egypt on the 17th of December in 2011, you might remember this scene the burning of the Egyptian Scientific Institute. L'Institut d'Egypte had been founded in 1798 by Napoleon after his, his invasion of Egypt. And not only was it the oldest scient scientific institute in Egypt, but it was the oldest library in the country and housed a rare collection of over 200,000, 200,000, excuse me, 200,000 volumes. During a clash between protesters and the Egyptian military, a Molotov cocktail was thrown and set the building on fire. It burned for 12 hours, consuming all but 30,000 volumes. Among the thousands of books lost, one of the most priceless was one of four original handwritten copies of the Description de l'Egypte, which contained nine volumes of text and 10 volumes of plates. The Description recorded the research conducted by 167 scholars who had traveled with Napoleon to Egypt and recorded everything they saw. Previously, Egypt had been relatively unknown to Westerners and the detail and draftsmanship of the drawings of the architecture and sculpture, as well as flora and fauna took the European world by storm. This is one of the typical images offered to the public while the library burned. But more hopeful were these pictures of volunteers who lived in the vicinity of Tower Square who had tried to salvage what could be saved even while the flames raged. 
Libricide continued and at times nearly daily in the, in the Middle East. In February of 2015, the Mosul Public Library was destroyed by ISIS. Incendiary explosive devices were used to destroy the Mosul University Theater, the Church of the Virgin Mary, and the Mosul Library, which was the repository of rare manuscripts that dated to various phases of Iraq's history. Over 8,000 rare books were destroyed. The destruction of the Mosul Public Library is part of the is Islamic State's ongoing attack against Mosul's library and cultural history. During the course of two months, ISIS militants had raided and devastated collections from the Mosul Museum Library, the University of Mosul Library, and an additional Sunni library. It was estimated that more than 100,000 books had been destroyed. In response to the catastrophic destruction in Mosul, the head of the UN's Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, said it was, quote, one of the most devastating acts of destruction of library collections in human history. The history of book carnage has been an extremely violent one, and that leads us full circle back to the subject of, of tonight's discussion, the Library of Alexandria. This is an artist's imagined view of what the destruction of that great library might have looked like. It's important to remember that it is a made up scene, and this may surprise you. It is actually diff difficult to speak about the Library of Alexandria because very little is known about it for certain. Its location has never been precisely determined by archeologists. The appearance of the structure is not known and the ultimate fate of the library has been disputed. So images like this are imaginary and will help set the tone for what we talk about next, but remember that they are invented. Scholars who write about libraries remind us that in the modern world, libraries are taken for granted by most people because they are everywhere. The OCLC, the Online Computer Library Center, which is a global library cooperative, estimates that there are today 1 million libraries worldwide. This is a staggering number and actually represents a modern phenomenon. Libraries were actually few before the 19th century. During the Middle Ages, knowledge was, cl uh, was closely held and books were placed in private repositories, often guarded by religious, as its artist's rendering suggests. But the previous scene has its actual basis in fact with any number of decorated medieval manuscripts that illustrate the copying of books often by solitary monks. It is the rarity of early libraries as well as the deserved reputation ascribed to the Library of Alexandria that has fueled the popular imagination. So what allows us to say anything at all about the library? It might be helpful to review what our evidence actually is. Extremely valuable are specific commentaries by this man, Julius Caesar, the Roman general and statesman, in the 40s BC, he engaged in political and military rivalry with the Roman general Pompey and followed him to Egypt where Pompey was murdered at Pelusium in the Eastern Delta. Caesar was in Egypt in 48-47 BC and was present in Alexandria and describes his time there in his work, Civil Wars. We will see that Caesar's presence has much to do with the fate of the library. Strabo's comments are also exceptionally important for what we learn about the library. As a Greek geographer who lived during the period straddling the first century BC and the first century AD, he went in 24 BC to Alexandria, then one of the largest cities in the world, and decided to reside there for some time. It is Strabo who gives us information about part of the layout of the structure that encompassed the library. Plutarch, the famous Roman historian and biographer, lived in the first and second centuries AD. Among his most important works were the Parallel Lives, detailed biographies of eminent Greek and Roman men. He wrote one about Julius Caesar, and from this source we learn more about Caesar's time in Egypt. 
Titius Flavius Josephus was a first century Roman Jewish historian born in Jerusalem, which was in the Roman province of Judea. Perhaps his most famous work is the Jewish War, which records the capture of Jerusalem by the Roman legions, led by Titus, the son of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. It must have pained Josephus because he was a personal friend and served as translator to Titus, whose soldiers were also responsible for the destruction of the temple and the siege of Masada. Josephus also wrote about the early history of the library at Alexandria, so his information is valuable to us. Galen was a celebrated Roman physician and biologist who was born in Asia Minor in the second century AD. During his training, he went to Alexandria to study at the famous medical school there, which may have been connected with the library, and he provides important information about how books were collected. Later, he went back to his hometown Pergamon and took care of men who fought in the arena, earning him the title of Surgeon of Gladiators. John Setzis was an influential Byzantine scholar and poet working during the medieval period, the 12th century AD. He wrote a huge book called the Book of Histories, which contained various comments on history, mythology, and things ancient. He also mentions 400 different authors, significant because some were not previously recorded. Setsi's importance is that he recorded things that had not been mentioned in other sources, but we should remember that he wrote from memory and did not have many written sources available to him. His comments are nonetheless critical because he wrote about the day-to-day -day operations of the library. There are several other ancient writers who commented on the great library, some of whom I list here. They offer individual comment and some of the workings of the library. So I have found the remarks useful in piecing together a fuller, pic uh, excuse me, a fuller picture for you. One thing we can say for certain is that the Library of Alexandria was not founded by this man, Alexander the Great. The young Macedonian general intent on campaigning against the Persian Empire was in Egypt in 332 and 331 BC. While inspecting areas in the Nile Delta, he found a stretch along the sea at the Western Delta that had an excellent harbor. He decided to establish city in his name. Actually, there would eventually be over seven, 70 cities founded by the general and named after him. This particular Alexandria would become the second most important city in the ancient world after Rome and would have a population between 500,000 and 750,000 people. Alexander died in Babylon in June of 323 BC. His body was embalmed in honey to preserve it for the long journey home from what is Iraq to Macedonia. The funeral cortege was diverted and Alexander was buried in Memphis, the capital of Egypt. His body was then moved to Alexandria, sealed in a coffin made of solid gold. We know that Julius Caesar visited the tomb as did other Romans. However, the mad emperor Caligula partially looted the tomb, removing the general's breastplate. The golden coffin was melted down for coinage with the body placed in one of glass or crystal. Over 40 different archeological expeditions have been mounted to find the tomb and it has yet to be identified. There is dispute over who created the library at Alexandria. Most scholars now concur that it was Ptolemy I Soter, one of Alexander's generals and his successor who established a family dynasty in Egypt. It was he who also moved the capital of Egypt from Memphis to Alexandria. Whether it was this Ptolemy or his son, Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who actually built the structure, we don't know. But it was the father and son who were responsible for the construction of the Pharos, the great lighthouse of Alexandria, that was known as one of the wonders of the ancient world. We know what it looked like because its image was printed on, imprinted rather, on Roman coins minted in Egypt and described by several authors. Built in successive levels, it was 100 meters tall and was topped by a statue of Ptolemy I. A 
A fire was kept burning in the top tier with the light projected out to sea using mirrors. And it was this way that ships were guided into the harbor. The lighthouse suffered um, through several earthquakes and by the 14th century, it lay in ruins. It was in 1994 that a French archeological team found what appears to be the remnants of the lighthouse at the bottom of the Eastern Harbor in Alexandria. Currently, Egypt is working with UNESCO to have the bay named a World Heritage Site. Because the Library of Alexandria was thoroughly destroyed and remnants have never been found, this is only added to the cachet of the structure. Numerous reconstructions have been posed for what was known as the greatest library in the ancient world. We can place the library within the ancient city on the basis of comments made by the Greek geographer Strabo. He said that an area of palaces stretched along the Great Harbor and it was called the Brukayan. It was filled with government buildings, parks, offices, public institutions, and royal grounds and residences. I've outlined the area for you in red, and Strabo said that the area took up one quarter to one third of the ancient city. Within was also the Great Museum, which translates into the home of the Muses. The Muses, of course, were nine Greek goddesses who were the patrons of the arts, music, poetry, literature, dance, history, and astronomy. Within the museum, and our word museum comes from the complex, were various buildings, lecture halls, a botanical garden, a theater, a shrine to the muses, and the famed library. In some, it was most like a university and became a center for learning. Strabo tells us more. The museum had a cloister and an arcade where the learned could walk. There was a larger house that provided common meals for men of learning who held their property in common. A priest had originally been in charge of the museum and was appointed by the Pharaoh, but now the Roman emperor did that. It is interesting that the library is never mentioned by any other source at the same time as the museum. So it's unknown whether the library was a separate building. The greatest scholars in the world were brought to Alexandria and taken care of at government expense and did not pay taxes. There were many who did not appreciate the upkeep of the scholars free of charge and questioned what they actually did all day. This quote is from the Greek skeptic philosopher Timon of Phlius. He says, quote, many are feeding in populous Egypt scribblers on papyrus incessantly wrangling in the bird cage of the muses. And I have to admit that this sounds um, like he's talking about university tenured professors. Where Ptolemy got the idea for the museum and the great library is uncertain, but there already had been a long tradition in the ancient world of important libraries and surely Ptolemy wanted to follow suit. Another reason for the library was clearly Ptolemy's intention to rival the cities being built by other generals of Alexander who had received areas of his vast empire. It was the Ptolemaic dynasty that created and funded the library, and certainly the objective was to foster Greek culture in Egypt and provide a link to an illustrious past. For Greek inspiration, Ptolemy did not have to look very far. In 387 BC, Plato had established his academy on the outskirts of Athens using land inherited through his family. Certainly philosophical discourse was popular there as well as dialectic and the academy attracted important mathematicians and theoretical astronomers. Membership was exclusive and the public was not allowed within the grounds. The academy was not a school in the modern sense, but as a place where intellectuals gathered, it continued for 900 years. It wasn't until the 20th century that the site of the academy was rediscovered and then confirmed in 1966 when a boundary stone was uncovered solidifying the identification. Aristotle, who was a student and philosophical successor to Plato, provided a more obvious link to Ptolemy with the school called the Lyceum. 
Located in a wooded grove in Athens, Aristotle established his peripatetic philosophical school, called that because he liked to walk around while he talked, and Aristotle also worked on the natural sciences. Having a close relationship to Alexander the Great, it was Alexander who gave Aristotle animal and plant specimens from his various conquests. In this way, Aristotle developed the first zoo and botanical gardens in existence. It was at the Lyceum that Aristotle began collecting a personal library that may have amounted to about 10,000 items that included his own work and student research. The Lyceum declined in importance when Athens as a city of culture began its eclipse in the first century BC. It was in 1996 when work got underway for a new museum of modern art that the ancient Lyceum was rediscovered with its foundation lying on bedrock. The site was opened to the public in 2009. Some modern scholars think it quite plausible that Aristotle may have been the inspiration for the library at Alexandria and provided the idea. Philip II of Macedon had selected Aristotle to be the personal tutor of his son Alexander. Aristotle held this post for seven years and after Alexander ascended the throne, Aristotle returned to Greece. However, the two remained in contact throughout, through letters it's been said that Alexander's custom of carrying books with him during his military campaigns and his love of reading and the arts were due to Aristotle's influence. Likely the, in <coughs> excuse me, likely the influence of, oh, I'm so sorry. Likely the influence of Aristotle on the establishment of the great library came through this man, Demetrius of Phaleron. He was a Greek warrior and statesman who became tyrant of Athens for 10 years, but was expelled in 307 BC. Thereafter, he was invited to settle in Alexandria, probably because of his connection with Aristotle and his school. Demetrius had been a student of the Lyceum in Athens and remembered well the layout of the school and the library that Aristotle had recently accumulated. It is through the historian Josephus that we learned something interesting about Demetrius. He recorded that Demetrius of Phaleron was the library keeper to Ptolemy, who was now the king of Egypt. He began a program of attempting to gather together all the books in the inhabitable world and had instructions to buy what was valuable or whatever the king wanted. So this man is the first librarian, and there will be many after him who are mentioned in later sources whose influence on the direction of the library was profound. Some of the men who were appointed as librarian of the great library in Alexandria were illustrious individuals and one of their first duties was to serve as the tutor for the royal children. Vitruvius, the great first century BC Roman architect said of the librarian of his day, every day he did nothing other than read and reread all the books of the library for the whole day, examining and reading through the order in which they were shelved. So basically Vitruvius says the librarian was a shelf reader and this would be a daunting task given the enormous number of books in the library, as we'll discuss in a minute. And if you think that what the head librarian did all day, sit in one place at a desk and read from sunrise to sunset, you would be very wrong because of how the library was arranged. Some of the librarians did more than actually make sure that manuscripts were stored correctly. Case in point was Xenotetus of Ephesus, who was librarian from 285 to 270 BC. As a Greek grammarian and scholar, he was a perfect appointee. He was the first to organize all entries into alphabetical order. This was important because previously there had been no system of library organization, and with the storage of thousands of items, this had posed a significant problem. Xenotetus was also a Homeric scholar and he created new editions of the Iliad and Odyssey, regarded as the pinnacles of literature authored by Homer in the 8th century BC. 
One of the great contributions of some of the librarians is that they created critical editions of some of the classic works of ancient authors, and some of those editions are the ones we read today. Callimachus of Cyrene was a Greek poet and scholar who worked at the library in the third century BC. Extremely knowledgeable and known for his great organizational skills, he was honored by the Egyptian Ptolemies. Callimachus is best remembered for his work called the Pina Case or Tables, which was a 120 bibliographical survey of all known Greek writers, 120 volumes. He divided their work into categories, epics, tragedies, comedies, history, medicine, rhetoric, law, and good thing he, he invented this category miscellaneous. Basically, he invented the first card catalog and his work actually proved to be the foundation for the Dewey Decimal System. Callimachus also provided a brief, excuse me, a brief biographical sketch of each author, arranged the list of authors in alphabetical order, and indicated the works of each author within opening lines and titles. It is by these titles that we associate ancient authors with their well-known writings. In addition to famous librarians, the great library at Alexandria also attracted the best scholars of the day who used the facilities to study, converse, and publish. So let's review a few of them. One of the most famous scholars to spend time at the library was Euclid, the Greek mathematician whose works spanned the late fourth and into the early third centuries BC. Because of his teaching and work, he was known and continues to be known as the father of geometry. His most important work was called The Elements, which was in part a set of geometric proofs. To be fair, Euclid did not originate all the theorems he published and he relied to some degree on the work of earlier mathematicians. His book was significant because in it, Euclid organized and summarized critical theorems in a logical and easy to use format. And Elements was the main textbook for teaching mathematics until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Supposedly during Euclid's time at the library, Ptolemy I became absorbed in his teaching and one day asked the mathematician whether there was an easier way to learn geometry than by the use of the elements. And this sort of sounds like a high schooler before the SAT exams, is there an easier way to do this? Anyway, supposedly Euclid replied to the king saying, there is no royal road to geometry. Another mathematician who was attracted to the library and perhaps this had been due to Euclid's earlier presence was Archimedes who came from Syracuse on the island of Sicily. Regarded as perhaps the most famous mathematician in antiquity, his work anticipated modern calculus. He was also a physicist, an engineer, inventor, and astronomer. Known in mathematics for closely approximating the value of pi and determining how to measure the area of a circle, Archimedes is perhaps best known for his inventions. He discovered the principle of the lever and fulcrum and this famous quote it, and this famous quote is attributed to him. Give me a lever and a place to stand and I will move the world. The Archimedes screw which had applications at a, as a water delivery system was well known in the ancient world. His war machines were significant in protecting his hometown of Syracuse from invasion by the Romans. He invented a catapult-like contraption that could fling heavy stones. The Archimedes claw was a large grappling hook that when mounted on a height could up and approaching boats. And Archimedes fire made use of mirrors to reflect the rays of the sun to burden enemy ships. Eratosthenes of Cyrene was also a learned Greek mathematician, but his expertise also included geography and astronomy and he lived in the third century BC. In addition to being appointed as librarian in Alexandria, many of his important discoveries and writings were accomplished there. Because of, excuse me, because of Alexander the Great's military campaigns and reports of unknown lands further to the east, 
Eratosthenes drew a map of the then known world that stretched all the way from Gibraltar to India. His map was far more accurate than any previous ones. The Greeks had known that the world was round. It was Eratosthenes who made the first calculation of the circumference of the earth. One day he was in Southern Egypt at Syene near modern day Aswan. At noon on the day of the summer solstice, he observed the reflection of the sun at the bottom of a well, so he knew that the sun was directly overhead. Another year at Alexandria, he observed that at noon on the summer solstice that the sun was not overhead, but cast a shadow that was seven degrees off vertical. Knowing that seven degrees was about one fiftieth of a circle of 360 degrees, and knowing the distance between Alexandria and Syene, he could calculate the circumference of the Earth. His calculations were extremely accurate. The Earth's circumference is 24,901 miles. Eratosthenes may have been only 360 miles off. Another very important Greek astronomer and mathematician who worked at the library in the third century BC was Aristarchus of Samos. Aristarchus made an immense contribution to astronomy in that he determined the relative sizes of the moon and sun from the earth and their distances from the earth. His measurements were not accurate. For example, he configured that the distance from the earth to the sun was 20 times greater than the earth to the moon. Actually, the distance is 400 times greater. He also posited that the diameter of the sun was seven times greater than the diameter of the earth. In reality, it is more than 100 times as big. One of the most important contributions that Aristarchus made was to propose a heliocentric model of the universe with the sun at the center because the sun was larger than the earth. He concluded that the earth revolved around the sun in a circular orbit and rotated on its own axis. This was extraordinary and had never been suggested before. It is interesting that this theory soon was abandoned after he proposed it and he was accused of impiety. Because of this, his astronomical works did not survive, but he is quoted by two other authors and it would be 108, excuse me, 1,800 years later that Copernicus would revive the concept of planets revolving around the sun shortly before his death in 1543. A different kind of scholar and one who was incredibly important to scientific exploration was Herophilus, a Greek medical doctor who moved to Alexandria as a young man and remained there throughout his life in the third century BC. Known as the father of, of anatomy, he was one of the founders of the medical school of Alexandria. His contributions were enormous and he was credited as the first man to undertake dissection in the ancient world. Previously, the internal workings of the human body were suggested by observing corpses of soldiers on the battlefield. Herophilus believed that in order for a doctor to be effective, he had to understand what happened inside the body. Not only did he undertake dissection, but it is recorded that he practiced vivisection, dissecting a still living body performed on criminals received from the Egyptian king. Contributions of Herophilus were, he proposed that the brain was the center of intelligence and not the heart. He named the cerebrum and the cerebellum. He investigated the heart and the circulatory system and determined that arteries carried blood. It was Herophilus who was the first to count pulses and recognize the relationship between a beating heart and a pulse. And he investigated the anatomy and function of the eye, liver, and intestines. The practice of human dissection likely was no longer permitted after him, which the growing Roman and Jewish presence would not have tolerated. As a scientific practice, it was not allowed again until the 14th century. Aristophanes of Byzantium was a noted Greek scholar and grammarian who worked at the library sometime during the late third and early second centuries BC. 
His accomplishment is that he invented Greek punctuation and also was responsible for organizing the metrics of Greek poetry. Previously, there was no punctuation in Greek writing. Nothing divided one word from another and texts were a continuous stream of letters. Imagine reading the Iliad, which is 15,693 lines long without any punctuation. So we've seen that the Library of Alexandria would have been a vibrant center of learning, but we should ask the question, what was its true attraction that brought scholars from all over the Mediterranean? The answer was simple, its scholarly collection. Ultimately, the library housed most of the written knowledge that had been accumulated, and it was the definitive repository of knowledge. We know that the Ptolemaic kings had an incredible source of wealth by taking possession of Egypt, and money was used to buy books. We learned from later sources that any ships that docked at the harbor in Alexandria had their books confiscated. Copies were made with the originals kept in the library and the copies given back to ship captains. To give you some idea of how serious the acquisition of books was in order to collect all the books in the known world, the third Ptolemaic ruler, Ptolemy III Eurogates, was given permission by Athens to borrow the original dramatic works of the great tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, the originals. These were the playwrights who had written Oedipus Rex, Medea, and the Oresteia trilogy. He put down a deposit of 15 talents to borrow the materials. That would be equivalent to about $400,000. The originals were sent to Alexandria and copies were made. Ptolemy decided to forfeit his deposit and keep the originals. This was great for the library, but not so great for history because the originals were lost when the library was destroyed. Within the library, all genres and styles of the Greeks were included, but also non-Greek texts were also stored. In general, the Greeks had little inclination to learn other languages, and they had a somewhat superior notion of what it meant to be Greek. Remember, too, that the Ptolemies were Macedonian Greeks. The tradition developed to translate into Greek all foreign texts in the library, so there were Greek translations of Babylonian, Egyptian, Phoenician, and Hebrew texts. The Septuagint, the Old Testament, was translated into Greek. The Egyptian king lists, Jewish law, and verses attributed to the Persian prophet Zoroaster were housed in the library. The great number of books meant prestige to the Ptolemies, and this set them apart from the rest of the Greek world. To give you some idea how important this was, there was a significant rivalry that developed, excuse me, between Alexandria and the Hellenistic city of Pergamon on the coast of Asia Minor. In the second century BC, the fame of the city of Pergamon was rivaled only by that of the city of Alexandria. As a center of culture, Pergamon also had its own library, which with nearly 200,000 texts and apparently the Ptolemaic kings considered it to be a threat. In ancient times, paper was made from the thinly split strips of the stalk of the papyrus plant, and Egypt had a monopoly on it because it grew only along the banks of the Nile River. In the second century BC, Ptolemy V decided to put a ban on exporting papyrus outside of Egypt, likely to impede the copying of ancient texts in Pergamon. This one act caused a revolution in writing that ultimately would impact on the form of how we read books. Pergamon had no choice but to develop a different form of material on which the written word could be affixed to a surface. Parchment, the skin of either sheep or goats was scraped and stretched and this became the vehicle by which scribes at Pergamon could continue the copying process of manuscripts. The form of the final written product was also dictated by the materials used. Papyrus becomes extremely brittle when dried and cannot be folded because it would crack. Papyrus sheets would be glued together and then rolled up into scrolls for storage. Parchment, on the other hand, does not crack when dried 
and rather than being folded, the common method of affixing parchment sheets was to stack them one on top of another and then stretch them, excuse me, stitch them together along one side. The two methods had existed together and it's been suggested that by the year 300 AD, the popularity of one method over the other was about equal. The use of the codex as the primary form for manuscript production has been attributed to the spread of Christianity. Interestingly, paper was invented in China in the first century AD and would ultimately replace parchment as a ve vehicle for writing because of the spread of paper from East into Arab lands and eventually into Europe in the 12th century. So the inside of the Library of Alexandria would have looked something like this, rows and rows of niches for the storage of individual papyrus rolls. And remember what I had previously mentioned about the librarian's chief job being to examine each roll and make sure that it was shelved in the correct place. This would have been an incredibly tedious job. With so many dry, fragile, and brittle papyrus rolls in the Library of Alexandria, you can easily imagine that their preservation had the potential to be precarious. And that brings us to consider the destruction of the library. The destruction of the Great Library has been variously debated by scholars, and one of the reasons for the debate is that our ancient sources are not necessarily in agreement with the facts. One thing seems certain, and that is the library suffered significant damage when Julius Caesar was in Alexandria in 48-47 BC. He was attempting to resolve the Alexandrian civil war between brother and sister, Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra VII, who were disputing the throne of Egypt. Ultimately siding with Cleopatra, Caesar was occupying the royal palace and his Roman force numbered only about 4,000. In an effort to drive Caesar from the palace, Ptolemy had cut off the water supply and he also had taken possession of the harbor. Caesar realized that for Roman reinforcements to arrive, he had to have access to the harbor. So we decided to destroy the Egyptian fleet by fire. Remember the proximity of the area of the royal palace, the harbor, and the library. The Egyptian fleet was burned, but some sources say that a great wind arose and carried burning embers along the docks, with flames running over the roofs and leaping from building to building. The whole seafront caught fire and with it, the Library of Alexandria. What was lost, we really don't know because the ancient sources contradict each other but nonetheless, the damage was great. Seneca, writing the first century AD, mentioned 40,000 books, although Aulus Gellius in the next century said 700,000 books were destroyed. Whatever the number, the destruction of the library was not complete because there are accounts of, of scholars still coming to the library to work. And there was another subsequent burning. The problem becomes even more compounded because there was more than one library in Alexandria. During the third century BC and while Ptolemy III Eurogatius was ruling, a second library was established in Alexandria in the temple of Serapis. This was known as the Daughter because it was smaller than the earlier great library. In the Daughter were copies of good editions that had been created by scribes in the main library. Sources claim that the smaller library had 42,800 papyrus rolls. In the royal collection in Alexandria, there were supposedly 400,000 composite rolls. And a composite roll would contain several works. And in addition, there were 90,000 single rolls. So even if the great library located within the museum near the harbor had been completely destroyed when the Egyptian fleet burned, the fire never reached the temple of Serapis. The library in Alexandria continued to exist for another 400 years because we know that it was this man, the Roman emperor Theodosius, who ordered the closure of all pagan temples throughout the empire. And in the case of Alexandria, the temple of Serapis that housed the daughter library was included. 
religious riots broke out in the city and it is reported that the temple became the last stronghold of the pagans, so it was stormed by Christians. An eyewitness account by Hypatia, a female philosopher and mathematician in Alexandria, who later was murdered by a Christian mob, recounted that the destruction was fierce and very likely the daughter library was burned. In the centuries after, Alexandria became a primary center of Christianity and remained so until 642 AD when it was conquered by the Arabs. In the 13th century, a story started to circulate that the library had been destroyed by the Arab military commander, Amr ibn al-As, who supposedly used the books of the library to heat the baths in Alexandria. Excuse me, he used the books of the library to heat the baths in Alexandria and has said the fuel lasted for six months. We don't know why the story was created, we can only guess, but scholars consider it to be false. Certainly by the seventh century, the famed library was gone and with it, the course of world history was changed. So what was lost? The Library of Alexandria had a reputation for housing all the known written language, excuse me, all the known written knowledge of the world. It had also attracted the best scholars alive and the open exchange of ideas fostered some of the most important discoveries of the time. Some modern scholars believe that if the library had survived, even though Christianity had become dominant, the dark ages would not have been so dark. Certainly what remained of manuscripts and texts throughout Europe would not have been so zealously guarded by the church. While doing research for his novel, The Alexandria Link, published in 2007, author Steve Barry learned that today we are aware of about 10% of the knowledge of the ancient world. 90% have been destroyed. So when we react in horror to the destruct libraries by sectarian violence, as was the case in January 2014, when the Sahel Library in Tripoli, Lebanon was burned, 50,000 books lost. It is hard to imagine what the contemporary reaction to the destruction of the Library of Alexandria would have been like. I don't want to leave you on such a negative note. The memory of the great library at Alexandria was so celebrated that even long after its destruction, it was regarded as a symbol of learning during the Renaissance. Because of the Library of Alexandria, the remaining books known to the world were reproduced and became known to scholars in the form they had acquired in Alexandria. Many works were now accompanied by critical marginalia explaining passages that were obscure or doubtful. Line numbers were used, especially if the work was verse. Another bright spot in the aftermath of the ancient library is the new library at Alexandria that was dedicated in 2002 by Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. Designed by a Norwegian, Austrian, and American design team, the building was constructed in association with UNESCO on the site in Alexandria, where the ancient library may have stood. A powerful symbol was employed in its construction. The dominating feature is the circle of the roof, which extends below ground, recalling the library's ancient past and it also accepts, extends up into the air, suggesting the library's impact on the future. The form of the circle is intended to represent the mathematical and geographic accomplishments of early scholars at the library, Euclid, Eratosthenes, and Archimedes. The placement of windows mimics microchips, the device that makes capable of the contemporary transmission of knowledge. Symbolism is also employed in the decoration of the outside wall of the library. <clears throat> Excuse me. Harking back to the tradition of ancient Egyptian sculpted wall reliefs, this granite wall is carved with a continuous relief of signs and letters of languages from all over the world. In total, there are characters 120 scripts. What also suggested is the letter as the smallest element of human writing it is critical in the transmission of information. 
The reading room of the library is the largest in the world and provides desk space for 2,000 patrons and, can, and covers 220 square feet, 220,000 square feet. Arranged on seven platforms, what you see are book carrels, stacks, main reading room, and closed book storage. The library has shelf space for 8 million books, and the collections have been donated from all over the world. It is the first mirror and external backup of the Internet Archive, and to give you some sense of the size of this archive, from 1996 to 2001, a mere five-year period, there were some 10 billion web pages that were produced. The new library complex includes other important structures. There's a conference center where scholars are invited to present ideas and debate. A planetarium and science museum recalls the illustrious past of the ancient museum and accomplishments of renowned astronomers. And an auditorium provides a venue for the dissemination of knowledge. In total, there are four museums, four art galleries, and, your and a manuscript restoration library. As you can imagine, a fire protection system was a priority for the new library because the ancient library was supposedly destroyed by fire. Librarians worldwide claim that water destroys more books than fire, so the system in the, in the new library was designed with this in mind. In the reading room and book storage areas, a water sprinkling system only goes off when smoke is detected. This is intended to avoid accidental knocking off of sprinkler heads located in the ceiling. In the manuscript and rare book areas, a gas extinguishing system has been installed. And in the offices and public non-sensitive areas, a traditional sprinkler system is employed. With the Bibliotheca Alexandrina, perhaps we have come full circle. I end with two quote, quotes from two different writers across the chronological spread of knowledge who referenced the importance of libraries. In the first century BC, the great Roman orator Cicero said that, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything. A poetic response to how critical libraries are was made by the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, who said, I've always imagined that paradise will be kind of a library. Let's hope that is true. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, so you, yes, we're getting lots of applause for silently. And maybe we'll have a moment at the end where we can all turn on our speakers and, and give you a wonderful round of applause because that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. So, so much material there to go through. And so, it's a wonderful, inspiring note as well to end on, which I don't know if many people were expecting that, but it is really inspiring. Um, let's see now. Just, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Um, now, let me just see. I'm going through the chat because wonderfully your talk has inspired a, a lot of, it's been sparking lots of ideas. So I'm sorry if I don't see your question right away. Oh, I should also note we are recording this talk. So if you don't want me to mention your name um, when I give your question, just send a little note saying don't mention my name. Um, but here we have. Um, a first question from Arkada de Boer. De Boer, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, he says, hello, you thought your lecture was fantastic and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it, it. This is someone in the ninth grade, wonderful. We're getting young people involved in archaeology, wonderful. Um, and they're looking towards the field of archaeology. Do you have any information you could give that might help a ninth grader to get into archaeology? Oh my goodness. Um... Within the last couple of years, I've gone to, to primary schools and have um, talked about archaeology to second and third graders. So if I can do it with second and third graders, ninth graders, you're, you're easy. Um, I think lots of people have this impression that archaeology is a treasure hunt. And in lots of ways, that's true. We find interesting stuff. But um, I always think it's best to reinforce that not only is it a treasure hunt, but it's a great big puzzle. And if you like to put pieces of information together and come up with a plausible whole, um, archaeology is, is just the profession for you. 
um, it's using your mind. It's using lots of, of different forms of evidence, um, lots of different disciplines, language, religion, history, culture, blah, blah, blah. Um, the best place to start is probably looking at programs offered by local museums. Um, that may not be possible now during the time of the pandemic, but um, there are lots of public programs that, that museums will put on. If you live in an area, I live in Phoenix, where there's lots and lots of local archaeology, many museums mount their own excavations. So that would be the place to start. And I'm sure that Ed and Allison can be in touch with you um, and put you um, in touch with services provided by the AIA. The AIA has a public outreach program that is geared towards um, providing information on excavations to the public. So that's also another source. So to begin with, be inquisitive, consult your public library and consult Allison and Ed and they'll get you in touch with the AIA. Fantastic. And we, we now have another question um, from somebody, Mary Price, who wants to know more about the content. Um, so they learned that it was mostly, or at least 50%, uh, was cook scrolls, as they put it, thus medicinal too. That's how they phrased it. <laughs> huh. Well, remember, um, the Ptolemies had this stated objective that any, any scrap of knowledge, any scrap of writing in the entire ancient world was to be deposited in the library. So yes, medicinal texts, um, um, because the medical school had been located there, but um, foreign texts were translated, written down on papyrus, rolled up in scrolls and put into a niche. So imagine today what's in a library and, you know, multiply that by a hundred thousand times and you can only imagine what was stored in the library of Alexandria. Cookbooks, uh, medical documents, treaties, blah, 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 literary texts, the list just goes on. So the loss of that library was a true catastrophe, but um, all supposed all the written knowledge of the ancient world. Great. Um, oh, and somebody has mentioned in the chat that the National Park Service um, has a program, going back to the previous question, called Passport in Time, that oh, recruits volunteers for archaeological projects. So keep your eyes open if that's what you're interested in. Um, right. And so we also have another question uh, who's asking about, um, and this is from DMS, uh, curious about Golden Age of Islam and even the Carolingian Ren Renaissance and connection to Harun al-Rashid. Oh, I cannot answer that question. I so apologize. If there's anybody else among the audience who has information, please. Um, I, I'm i not capable of, of fielding that question. I'm sorry, because I, I work in centuries um, far removed from the Islamic period. Oh, and here's a question, though. Um, have you published um, on the Library of Alexandria? If somebody wanted to do further reading. No, I I publish work on um, material from Israel and Cyprus. So um, I have to tell the audience, you know, I think of myself as something like a dilettante when it comes to the Library of Alexandria. So I'm, no, I haven't published anything on this, but it's mm -hmm. a fascinating topic. And you made a brilliant case for how it has been so formative in our, in, of our world today. Um, and here's from Jeff Pamblanco. Um, he would like to know, um, do you think that correspondence and what we might not think of as personal writings would ever have been kept in the Library of Alexandria? Hmm. Um, I rather doubt it, um, unless they were personal writings that ultimately took the form of treaties. Um, we know that, that some uh, I mean, for example, like the Amarna letters, which are, you know, the great correspondence um, from the New Kingdom in Egypt, um, the Amarna letters were never um, uh, then placed within the library. So I, I doubt that personal correspondence from king to king, unless there was something so very, very, very official that it, it took the form of a treaty um, that likely would not have been copied and then, and then um, placed in the library. Great, thank you. I'm looking through to see if I can see any 
little hands raised and, and don't hesitate to type in the chat if you have a question and I'm not seeing your hand being raised. Or I might take the opportunity to ask the question for myself, if I may. Um, you made a very moving case for um, the power of libraries and how we should try to protect them. And of, of course, how libraries are still being destroyed today. Uh, what do you think is the greatest threat to libraries today? And what do you think we should be doing to try to look after them? Boy, this is a question that could easily get me talking politics. So I, I would say, um, I, I, I don't believe in censorship, but libraries should be a repository for truth and we need to protect truth. Um, so libraries, I like to think of a library as, um, as sacred as a church, that what is included in, or enclosed within a library is precious material. Um, I would also say, and I, I say this because right now I am I'm teaching a, a course on research methods and art history, and um, my students are being instructed into write into writing scholarly papers. And no offense to all the students out there, but somehow you guys think that the internet is the be all and end all of a research material. Nothing, 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 nothing replaces um, the written word. So. Um, libraries are precious, the scholarship is precious, libraries need to be used and not um, shunted aside for the more um, convenient access of the internet. Such an important thing to remember, especially as, um, in this sort of post-pandemic world. We've had another question from Rosemary Riley, um, who is asking, was the medical school in Alexandria housed in the same area as the library? And was that also destroyed by the fire? Um, we really uh, we really don't know. I do not know. Um, as I don't know in terms of the publication record of Herophilus, the uh, anatomist, um, what remains. Um, I would imagine that it was housed in the museum um, and that would have been destroyed in, in the various fires. So unfortunately, yes. Great. Um, now, does anyone have any further questions? And feel free to unmute. Oh, here comes one. Um, Aisha Miller says, I heard there were statues and monuments that were part of the Library of Alexandria. Um, can you speak to that, the, 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 the material building? Um, I really can't because Strabo is the only one who talks about the physical structure, but doesn't mention, he mentions that, but he doesn't really mention the accoutrements or decorations. Um, so I don't know. And um, in terms of Hellenistic sculpture from Egypt and, and even Roman sculpture coming from Alexandria, um, I am not familiar really with that body of work that might have been placed within the museum, so I don't know what might have been destroyed. Fantastic, thank you. And Alfred Bloom would like to know, um, did, this moves, um, did Julius Caesar ever visit the Library of Alexandria? Before oh, sure he did. We, we don't know. I mean, he doesn't record that in his, in his memoirs, nor does, does Plutarch mention that he did, but I'm, I'm sure he would have. But, um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he would have because the palace where he was residing was very close uh, to the library. And even though he was involved in the intrigue between Cleopatra and Ptolemy, um, given Julius Caesar's respect for knowledge and the very fact that he was an intellectual, I'm sure he would have visited the library. Wonderful. And coming on to your conclusion as well, people were remar marveling at the, the digital thi of things that are available at the a modern library of Alexandria. Um, and, and there was a question, is, is that library or are any libraries keeping non-digital records of digital information that you know of? Say that again one more time, Alison. Uh, are any libraries keeping non-digital records of information that we sort of generated digitally or online? 
Um, I don't know. I mean, when you when you do searches for the Library of Alexandria and you read about their your, their acquisition policy and how they store materials, um, they they the library has been given um, physical books, physical manuscripts by libraries worldwide. I'm sure they would do well to digitize that, but I don't know indeed if that is the case. And the flip side of that, I do not know if the library then prints out digital records. Um, uh, given the catastrophic history of the library in Alexandria, I would imagine there's a move to digitize everything and have a complete record of that as the priority. Fantastic, thank you. And, and all the people who asked questions are also saying thank you for, uh, in the chat. Um, there's also a question, what is the difference between our National Archives and the Library of Congress? Oh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. Um, National Archives and the Library. I'm sure their websites will be keen to yeah. tell people. <laughs> Given what I just told you that the internet is not the be all and end all, I might <laughs> check the internet and, and find out. I don't. I don't know. Well, and um, people are also wondering about the types of material that were held in the Library of Alexandria. In addition to pi papyrus, do the histories ever suggest that clay tablets were held in the Library of Alexandria? I doubt that. Um, not that I know of. Uh, that would have been so. Uh, well, who knows? I mean, because the clay tablets might have been sent to Alexandria um, and then probably copied onto papyrus rolls and then what they did with the clay tablets, we don't know. But my goodness, it would be so much fun to find the like the spoil heap of the, Alexand the library and excavate that and see what actually was in there, if indeed that, that survived the fires. But that would be fascinating. Fingers crossed when we're allowed to travel again. Maybe one of the people listening will be able to find it somewhere. <laughs> now, are there any other questions? I don't see any raised hands. So feel free, but feel free to unmute yourself if you've had your hand up for ages and I just can't see you. Anybody? Right, well, I, I'm sure um, if you have other questions, um, we can perhaps deal with them in the fullness of time. But um, for the moment, I think, it, as you can see, uh, Dr. Sherwood, you've generated so much excitement. Uh, oh, somebody um, is now linking out oh, about the caliphate and the preservation of classical knowledge. Oh, I see, yes, the idea of how, how classical knowledge is being preserved. Anyway, fantastic. Um, so I don't see any further questions. So just to say, uh, thank you, Dr. Sherwood. As you can see from all these questions, people's imaginations have been sparked. I think earlier, Shauna said it best that um, all these questions we've had, often since we were little kids about the Library of Alexandria, you've been able to answer. So it was a really thrilling talk and thank you so much for coming. I, thank, um, thank you and thank you all. My goodness, it's Friday night. Um, so, <laughs> so thank you for, if, for inviting me.